It's a joy and a privilege to be with you at Summerlink this evening. And I want to suggest that the question that we're going to be engaging with is that of what will the culture of the church be like if God is concerned for all nations? Culture is easily defined, I guess, as the way that we do things around here. Behaviors observable at a surface level, which are obviously rooted deeply into a worldview. The way that we do things around here. Families have cultures. Growing up in the David household, we would often hear the phrase, we just don't do that in our family. And that would be your cue to stop doing immediately what you were doing without any need for further reason. Or positively, it would be said, well, this is how we do things in our family. Uh, the moment you'd notice it most is when you visited other households and we'd come back at the end of the day and the question to the parents would be, well, why, why are their children allowed to watch the amount of TV that they are? Why do they get to eat what they eat and, and drink what they drink? Christianity was born and raised in a Jewish household. The way that we do things around here in the early church was heavily flavored by Jewish culture. Uh, their differenceness from other cultures was grounded in God himself. They were to be a holy people because God was holy and he had prescribed for them in the law as to how they should live holy lives. And so what happened as we come to the book of Acts was an intense period of dramatic change. Luke chapter 24 frames the Summerling series. And Jesus from verse 44 onward says, um, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He opened their mind to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, the Christ must suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And so as we step into Acts, it's the working out of that mandate. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 gives the scheme for the book of Acts. Jesus says, My spirit will empower you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The, the spread of the gospel geographically, but also through different cultures. Because I guess what you need to have in mind in God's concern for all nations is at this point there there is, in a sense, a change in direction. In the Old Testament, if you wanted to join the people of God, you, you had to come to Israel geographically, physically, you had to be with them. You also had to be with them culturally. But now the church was, was going out. The gospel was radiating out to other nations and cultures, which means that the activation of God's concern for the nations was picking up momentum. The early trickle of Gentile converts at become a flood. Uh, the church in Antioch had been established, Acts chapter 13, a, a thoroughly diverse church in the midst of a cosmopolitan city, which got to function as a bridge to all of the nations because it was different from Jerusalem, it, which was a largely monoculturally Jewish church. Uh, and that church in Jerusalem could never have been the bridge that Antioch was. But what that created was a problem which is expressed there in verse 1. But some men came down from Judea to Antioch, and they were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so I'm going to call them the heavies. They're a pressure group. Verse 5 calls them the party of the Pharisees or the Judaizers. They were insisting on circumcision. Verse 5, it is necessary. Literally, it's a divine necessity. Um, and that wasn't their only demand. Verse 5, they also insist that the Gentile Christians should be required to keep the law of Moses. And so to be clear, the, the problem is not whether or not a Gentile can become a Christian. We've seen in our journey through Summerlink that that was rooted deeply in the promises of the Old Testament. From the covenant with Abraham through into the Psalms, blessing of all nations via Israel's king and into the prophets like Isaiah. Uh, this problem, that this week, the problem is much more specific. It's not, can a Gentile be a Christian? It's how did Gen God intend for Gentiles to be included in the church? Uh, so we're okay with God welcoming them, but on what basis do we welcome them? What practices do they have to adopt in order to be acceptable? Which do they have to stop? And so you already get to have the sense, don't you, 
that this is a really practical question for them back then and also for us today. And so does, for example, the decolonization of South Africa mean also purging it of the white man's religion? Um, who is Christianity for? And where is the center? And Acts chapter 15 speaks directly into that kind of watershed moment. Acts chapter 15 is often referred to as the Jerusalem Council. Effectively, it was a consultation between Paul and his crew from Antioch with the leaders of the Mothership Church in Jerusalem. Uh, and I trust that you sense from the tone of the engagements that there was a recognition of the gravity of the problem, that it did indeed represent a watershed moment for the young church. And as we examine that consultation, we're going to see two ground rules that will prevent the church then and today from making missteps in God's concern for all nations. Two basic principles that we must keep needing into the culture of our church so that they permeate the way that we do things around here. Those two things keep clarifying gospel freedom and keep strengthening gospel community. Firstly, keep clarifying gospel freedom. So far, the assumption had been that the Gentiles would be included into God's people by being circumcised, by observing the law, because that was the mark of incorporation into the Old Testament people of God. If you were from the nations, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 48 said that a foreigner, a stranger could celebrate the Passover, that defining meal of the redeemed people of God, but only if they were marked with a sign of the covenant with Abraham, namely circumcision. And then be following the food laws and the cleansing laws. Essentially, the requirement was that they should become culturally Jewish. But now that was being disrupted and it was upsetting the heavies because Gentile converts were being included in the church simply by faith in Christ, signified by baptism, but without circumcision because Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, was not insisting on it, with the effect being that these Gentiles were retaining their own cultural identity as members of other nations. It was upsetting because it played on an underlying fear of what the kingdom of God would look like. As John Stott puts it in his commentary, the situation posed the revolutionary question at a watershed moment. Is the gospel a reform movement within Judaism or is it good news for the whole world? Is the church just a sect within Judaism, or is it the international family of God? And we know it's an important issue because Paul stands up to the heavies in verse 2. Then verse 3, the Antioch church sends him to Jerusalem to engage the apostles on this question. Arguably, the second most influential person in all of history after the Lord Jesus. And he stops what he is doing and he travels the 250 miles to consult and when he arrives in Jerusalem, they take it seriously. Verse 6, the apostles and the elders are gathered together to consider the matter, uh, with weighty representations being given, including from Peter and from James. Why? Because of what was at stake, which was gospel freedom. You see, how the church handled it was that they clarified that gospel freedom. Uh, the freedom of the gospel, you, you, in this uh, context, you could summarize as Christ has come to lift off of you the burden that self-righteousness imposes. Uh, that language of burden comes out in different ways. Verse 10 speaks of a yoke on the neck of the Gentiles. Verse 19 speaks of troubling in the sense of adding an unnecessary requirement. And verse 28 uses the language of burden. Because what is unique amongst all worldviews to Christianity is that salvation or acceptance by God is never something that you can earn or deserve. Rather, it is a free gift. It is not something that you can achieve. It is something that you receive. Not what you do, but what Christ has done. And in the light of that, um, all of the Levitical customs and circumcision and Moses laws were a burden. Verse 11, Peter says, Christ has lift off lifted off that burden. They are not requirements for or markers of belonging to God's people. Verse 11, but we believe 
that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they, the Gentiles, will. Uh, we do need to ask the question, for integrity's sake, how is it that the council can legitimately dispense with circumcision? Because it is the God-given sign of the Abrahamic covenant. It is embedded in the law, which is the same for the native and for the foreigner. And not just circumcision, but, but the ceremonial laws, such as the sacrificial system, the laws about cleansing. Well, the straightforward answer is because they have been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Circumcision is the one that the heavies are most interested in. And so we'll consider that. But you could apply this to the other categories of ceremonial laws as well. You see, physical circumcision provides a shadow which has been fulfilled in Christ's work of spiritual circumcision. The cutting off of the physical flesh pointed to the need for sinful fleshly hearts to be circumcised. Moses himself said so. Um, here he is standing, tablets in hand in Deuteronomy 10. And he says in verse 12, What does the Lord require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve him with all of your heart and with all of your soul, and to keep the commandments that I'm giving you today. Verse 16, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. Loving from the heart requires spiritual circumcision of sinful hearts. But as it turns out, um, Israel are not able to do the heart surgery on themselves. And so God, by the end of Deuteronomy, in chapter 30, verse 6, promises that he will perform the procedure by himself, by his spirit. Verse 6, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. And the gospel says that in Christ that has taken place. It has been fulfilled. Colossians 2 calls it the circumcision of Christ done without hands. It's not called spiritual circumcision in Acts chapter 15, but that is what Peter is describing in verse 7 to 9. And I want you to note the process in those verses. Verse 7, Peter says, In the early days God made a choice amongst you that the, that the gospel should go to you by my mouth. And verse 8, God who knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Uh, that is the mark of the genuine Christian. That is your marker of belonging. That by his spirit, through faith in the gospel, which has come to you in the word, he has circumcised your sinful heart and given you his spirit and you belong to him. And so Peter's cry in verse 9, his, his warning is don't get God wrong on this. God did this work. He sees that the Gentiles have been made clean by faith. He has given them, therefore, his spirit. And therefore, he makes no distinction. And this watershed moment in Acts chapter 15 is the moment where the church took the bull by the horns and started to apply that gospel culture deep into the culture of the church. If Christ has taken off that burden, then do not trouble the Gentiles. Do not reimpose that burden on them. Um, even the Jewish believers have had those burdens lifted off. They're not required. So to require the Gentiles to drum through these cultural hoops is to deny the gospel of grace. And the same today, anytime you add a requirement other than faith in Jesus, whatever that might be, whether it's meeting your church leader's expectations, whether it's matching up to your own spiritual or holiness goals, whether it's ticking the box on conservatism or wokeness that's required in your constituency, you are making a distinction that God doesn't, and it destroys freedom. Because you've got the wrong Jesus, a Jesus who didn't really need to die. There are people who are really lost, but people like me are clean enough. We just need a few finishing touches. The temptation with our cultures today, yours and mine, is to wear our culture as a marker of belonging, as a badge of honor, uh, where the way that we do things around here takes on more than a cultural significance, it becomes spiritually significant as well. And when that happens, it nullifies the gospel. Richard Lovelace wrote 40 years ago on the dynamics of spiritual renewal in the church. 
and he said the following thus, those who are not secure in Christ cast about for spiritual life preservers with which to support their confidence and in their frantic search they cling not only to the shreds of ability and righteousness they find in themselves, but they fix upon their race, their membership in a party, their familiar social and ecclesiastical patterns and their culture as means of self-recommendation. The culture is put on as though it were armor against self-doubt, but it becomes a mental straitjacket which cleaves to the flesh and can never be removed except through comprehensive faith in the saving work of Christ. The naked gospel is scandalous. Our cultural straitjackets are stubbornly resistant to be ta being taken off. And that is why the heavies came down from Jerusalem. The heavies um, also came down on the Cape Colony in the 1730s. The problem there was that the Moravian missionary George Schmidt had been faithfully sharing the gospel with the indigenous Khoi people, and he had baptized a handful of converts. So the heavies, um, this time in the form of the Cape Dutch Reformed Church, um, their official objection was that Schmidt wasn't officially ordained, but really the issue was that the people that Schmidt was baptizing are not like us. Uh, they don't have all of the cultural markers that the established church deemed necessary. At base, I guess it came down to a fear of otherness. So the Mor Moravians got shut out. George Schmidt was forced back to Europe in 1744. But 50 years later, three Moravian missionaries returned. And when they returned, they found Lena, one of those early converts, converted as a young woman, who had kept gospel faith alive for five decades through reading and sharing from the New Testament that Schmidt had left with her. They restarted the mission and they renamed it Genadendal, which means Valley of Grace. It's the name that President Mandela took and renamed his official presidential residence. It was the first mission station in South Africa and it became a powerhouse for later gospel mission, all because they were clear on gospel freedom. And so Acts chapter 15 confirms that the Jewish cultural separation was only for a time. Now God's people includes all tribes and nations and tongues. And so if you're a Roman, you don't have to become culturally Jewish to be really saved. You don't have to become culturally anything. If you are Asian or African or Australian or American, whatever you are, you become a Christian where you are. And you don't have to leave and become culturally something else. Christianity is not a white man's religion or a black man's religion. Jesus gets to set the dress code. And so if clarifying gospel freedom ensures that no culture can claim to belong to God more than any other, the question then might arise, and this is one that I grapple with a lot in our context, um, how then are we to operate in the resulting diverse church? And the answer is our second point, keep strengthening gospel community. From verse 24, the council distanced themselves entirely from the heavies. They were not sent by us. Um, we reject what they have said, and they respond in a letter, uh, the wording of which is in verse 28 and 29. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Um, we're not going to require anything of you. We're not going to burden you with anything except these requirements. That's fascinating, isn't it? it? You're not required to keep the Jewish ceremonial laws, but there are some requirements we would like to lay on you, including some ceremonial laws. Verse 29, don't eat meat, sacrifice to idols, don't eat from blood or from what is strangled. Uh, and so what's weird is, is those are things that they are free to do. Paul would later say that in 1 Corinthians 8 to 10. You're free to eat meat sacrificed to idols if it doesn't represent a personal stumbling block for you. Um, but then there's abstain from sexual immorality. The word there is porneia, um, which would never have been allowed 
And so it's a confusing list. Uh, some things they were free to do, but the apostles are now requiring them to stay away from. Um, sexual immorality, which they were not free to do, and now the apostles are highlighting it. And so the commentators struggle to put them together. Can I say that the way through is to ask the question, why does James pick these issues that he mentions um, as he raises them in what is called James's clauses? Um, or you could put the question this way. In the Just for Starters course that they were running at Christ Church Antioch, discipling these new Gentile converts, which chapter would the issues in verse 29 be in? You can imagine the Just for Starters course, they couldn't you? So, so chapter one would be, I guess, everything that we've covered about God's concern for the nations in Summerlink so far, kind of a biblical theology thus far. Chapter two would be the gospel and the fulfillment in Christ, which would be point one of our talk, the gospel freedom that Gentiles have in Christ. Um, chapter three would be on holiness. And in there would be things like verse 29. Those issues are all bound together. They were part of their idolatrous background, their heritage, their history. And, and, and the holiness chapter would be say, well, we'll steer clear of those, put those off and put on Christ instead. But I think that James is including these issues here because he would want them inserted into the chapter on the church. How you are now to live in a diverse but united church. Because the issues in verse 29, whilst they, they might be stumbling block for the Gentiles in Antioch, they certainly would be stumbling blocks for Jewish believers to whom those Gentile believers have now been united by the work of the Lord Jesus. Because these Jewish believers, um, for them, these matters of food and sexual morality and cleanness, they're, they're so closely tied with their concept of sin they're so deeply ingrained. Verse 21, James highlights for generations in every city, every Sabbath, they were taught again and again from the law of Moses. They would have been deeply ingrained in the Jewish culture. And so for a Gentile to be tainted by those things, to not have avoided contact with those things, would be placing a burden on the Jewish Christian to have any kind of close fellowship with them. And so the council say abstain, literally avoid contact with those behaviors. Otherwise, those Jewish believers would, well, they couldn't come close. They would, they would have to stay socially distant from you, let alone having you in your, their home or sharing a meal with you. That kind of division happened at one of our Bible colleges in Cape Town a few years back. There was a major sex scandal on campus. And I wonder what springs to mind as I say that. The issue was that it had been observed that, that dating couples, and this was happening even on campus, were seen walking together, holding hands. That was the scandal. Um, it was scandalous to African brothers and sisters because culturally, a man and a woman who were holding hands in public, it indicated that they were sexually intimate with each other, that they were sleeping together. And therefore, that's only appropriate in a Christian context for a man and his wife. And so the result of that, is, as they observed this behavior of these dating couples, was suspicion and it was division. You see, you get a flavor for that of how this might produce a dysfunctional marriage within the church. You imagine the marriage counseling situation. You don't have to be a trained counselor to be able to spot the problem. If a couple comes to you and says, we've, we've got our marriage certificate, we said the vows, we've got the photo on the wall, um, but actually, we're really struggling to be in the same room together. We, we, we don't want to sit down at a table and share a meal together. You see, you would say to them, you're not united. The reality of your covenant still has to be worked out in love, practically. And so the letter that the council sent to Antioch communicates that gospel freedom is real, but it is a freedom that is to be constrained by the debt of love. And so I agree with commentators like John Stott and Daryl Bock that the point of these clauses, these four requirements, is not ultimately to do with the Gentiles avoiding idolatry as, a, as an end in itself, but avoiding it so that it wouldn't prevent unity. So that the church would become something more than multicultural. Understand what I mean when I say that. Um, a church being multicultural is having a, a diverse group of people in the same church together, right? But actually what is wanted is more than that. You don't, you don't want a situation 
where in the church, a Gentile convert says, well, I've been converted, I've come to Christ. And they say, well, great, well, you can go off to Christ Church Antioch. That's where our Gentile church is. Uh, if you're Jewish, then you need to go to Christ Church Jerusalem, for that's where our Jewish believers are. No, you want a transcultural people of God who are genuinely united in Christ. The burden the council are placing on them is the burden of love. And you can trace that in the Romans 13, the Galatians 5 quotes on your outlines. Christ has, has fulfilled the law of love that we could never fulfill. He perfectly kept it. He took the punishment for our failure to keep it. He has circumcised our hearts and he has freed us up. He has disposed us towards loving God and loving his people. And so we should get on and do that. And I wonder, stepping back, if, if you take those two things, if you really grasp your gospel freedom and security, together with grasping the burden of love, those are a powerful combination because they put you in a place within a church where it is possible to view your culture and that of others very differently, no longer as badges of superiority or inferiority. But instead, we can appreciate the culture of others and we can accommodate ourselves to them, not standing on our own way of doing things. Richard Lovelace's quote continues, once faith is exercised, a Christian is free to wear his culture like a comfortable suit of clothes. He can shift to other cultural clothing temporarily if he wishes to, as Paul suggests in 1 Corinthians. And he is released to admire and appreciate the differing expressions of Christ shining out of other cultures. If the apostolic church had failed to take the steps described in Acts 10 to 15, its spread amongst the nations would have stopped dead and the power of God would have been withdrawn from its inner life. I'm not sure what you make of that last line. I've put it in your questions for reflection. It felt overdramatic when I first read it, but it goes back to the Stott quote. You know, perhaps the church would have grown. God is sovereign and he is able to grow his church in whichever way he chooses. But what was grown, the product of it, might have looked very different. And I also wonder if, if the experience of God's power to unite people across barriers that could not be broken down in any other scheme, if that power, the observation of that power, would have been severely diluted to some degree. Issues of culture are close to us. They're, they're as close as the clothing that we wear, even closer. And so they can be highly charged. But these two ground rules give us a mandate and some parameters for having the kinds of difficult conversations that are needed in the life of a church. It helped them back then. It helps us today to be able to, to hold up every culture, um, whether it's ours or another one, because all of them are mixed. There, there are things that are good and true and there are things that are not. To hold every culture up to the light of the gospel and to view it through that lens. It's like spiritual WD-40, um, which, which has two functions. It, it has the function of unlocking, removing the rust, engendering the freedom for the thing to work as it should. But it also has, a, it has this protective covering function. And so I wonder if there isn't some of that going on in these two ground rules. I remember when Sophie and I did marriage prep many moons ago, uh, we did it with Doug and Nancy Olson, who very helpfully said to a couple around the age of 30, who had some pretty firm ideas of the way that things should be done around here. They helpfully said that everything needs to go into the melting pot in our new partnership. A new covenant has been entered into, a new reality that you've stepped into. And you both bring to it your individual cultures. And both of those cultures need to be held up to the light of the gospel. And, and with wisdom work out, how do we live together as a gospel team? No defaulting to how we did it growing up. No heavies. So that we don't get the gospel wrong, and the same in the church, so that we don't get the gospel wrong and we don't get wrong his concern for all nations.